Follow your muse, we tell artists. Follow the money, we urge the rest. But what if pursuing our creative tendencies leads us to that hidden treasure? Increasingly, the spark of innovation is driving real economic success in our region. Even as we lament the loss of jobs overseas, a number of imaginative entrepreneurs are adding billions of dollars in benefits to our economy. One of them is a world-famous photographer. The other is building an ice cream empire. Together, they'll explain how to cultivate both passion and profit. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks. You need an innovator's heart to be a professional photographer in the digital age. When we all have cameras in our pockets, how do you get companies to pay for your images? Chase Jarvis has shot for Apple, REI, and Nike for over a decade, even as he connects the old world of media with the new. His YouTube channel, Chase Jarvis Live, has nearly 8 million views. He's one of the first professional photographers to film high-definition video on an SLR camera. And Chase's Seattle 100 book profiles creative people, groups, and companies who have collectively contributed more than $13 billion to the local economy. Chase, welcome. Thank you so much, Hanson. It's a pleasure. So you once even wrote a book called The Best Camera is the One With You. So how on earth do you make a living when we all have these cell phone cameras? Well, actually, that was that was the idea behind it. Um, You're it's, trying to put yourself out of business? Yeah, well, that, that seems like it's not all about business. There's a there's a bigger cause behind it and, and the idea that a, a more creative world is a better world. So uh, that's one of the things that I found very, very early on when I started noticing that cameras were started having, or uh, phones started having cameras in them. Um, they were notoriously referred in my industry as crap. And, um, and why would anyone want those things? But I noticed that I always had one of these with me. And that's a, it's an important thing to think about when you're an artist because if you are limited when you can create by what sort of tools you have with you, you know, that's, that's a limitation. And, and as like even when the iPhone first came out, that was a really, really important thing for me because I realized that, hey, I'm standing, I can create just while I'm standing in line waiting for coffee. I started doing that and sharing those images every day. And lo and behold, the goal was trying to get people to think, if I could, wait, wait a minute, if I could get people to think and we're talking how many people have cell phones, and you can see that they're all going to have cameras in the near future. We can instantly activate a world of literally six billion photographers. So this is great, and I love this as an academic, yeah. but I can imagine a marketing executive at one of these corporations saying, you know what? We don't need Chase and his fee anymore. Let's just go get a few hundred people and get their cell phone cameras out and capture some images. So, well, I think that's a fair assumption. But the idea that behind my approach is, is really a rising tide floats all the boats sort of, a, of approach. And, uh, and I think there's, in large part, these professional circles that I travel in uh, are, are a meritocracy. And if I'm encouraging the world to be artists in and of their own right, then hopefully it'll drive me to a better place to become a, a better artist and a bit more creative in my own right. So that was the, uh, that's the idea, and I hope that when in doing so that we created this, this bed of, of artists that are also considering themselves to be creative. And in fact, it's, if, if that's the key, um, mm -hmm. you actually ratcheted up the level of professionalism and even the technology. Like even today you spent some time with a, a really expensive device that you can't necessarily fit in your pocket, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, a hundred and fifty thousand dollar Phantom camera doesn't necessarily fit in your back pocket or fit in the average bank account. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm as a creative, I'm interested in exploring a variety of tools and the work that I did to try and get the world to think about uh, the the things that are in our devices that we we talked on to try and get them to think of that as a camera was a was a big challenge, but one that didn't have a lot of barrier. It was really a flip of a switch in the mind. And, and lo and behold, I was effective. We put out the first, that, that best camera's the one that's with you, was the world's first book of, 
of uh, mobile phone pictures. So yeah, and this camera itself is not particularly expensive. I saw you walked in with a four thirds mi micro four thirds uh -huh. camera. These are sort of like the new wave of interchangeable lens cameras. Yep. Not as expensive as SLRs, better than point and shoots. I'm actually very surprised that a person of your stature in the industry would actually have uh, a relatively amateur camera like this. Wow. Well, hey, look, the uh, the idea of of a professional traveling the world. I, I travel 150,000 miles a year and go to some amazing locations, so often with a really large crew um, to create commercial imagery, whether that's moving pictures in the form of a commercial or still pictures. And at the end of that you know, one, two, or three week process, we're in New Zealand with 50, 60 people, and we create one or two pictures. That, that world of creativity versus me with my iPhone, like I ultimately can feel more creative with my iPhone. And that's a weird thing as a professional, and that's been your livelihood and, and how you've, you've worked so hard to get to that level that ultimately this $300 thing that's in my pocket gives me the sort of feelings that, that uh, are really closest and nearest and dearest to the fundamental creativity. So, so freedom and no expectations, just the ability to connect right to the universe. Yes, yeah, right? and, and at a moment's notice. And again, the, with the, the mantra that it's always with us, that, you know, that the best camera is the one that's with you. That, to me underscores creativity in the, the proper sense more than, than traveling the world and doing super fancy stuff with super fancy people and super fancy gear. So the little four thirds cameras, like I love to run around with one of those things. It's great. So Sounds great. I total, I'm totally with you, right? But you still right. do the business stuff. Right? You course. still run around with the stars, sure. but you also believe in connecting to the, the creative soul that you are. Uh, how do you balance those two? Um, I follow my heart, to be honest with you. It sounds a little bit cheesy, maybe trite, but uh, there's no, no, no two ways about it. I, I make a living as a creative, and for that, there's a business component to it. I've managed to surround my, myself with some business folks that are really, really good at that, that part of it. Um, but at the end of the day, what matters to me, what I want to go to my grave with, is you know, how, much, how much change did you bring to the world, how much growth, how much vision. Uh, and that necessarily doesn't come through the most creative or the most uh, commercial channels. Sometimes it does, you know. Uh, there was a commercial aspect to that iPhone thing, for example. I made an iPhone app that was the first app in the world to share direct to social networks. Well, now every photo app shares to social networks, and there's hundred, there's probably fifty thousand of those sorts of of, uh, of apps in the in the iTunes App Store. But it, it, at its core, it's not a commercial project. It's yeah. it's it's a it's a a personal vision of trying to, to change the world and disrupt things. Not for the sake of being a disruptor, but I do enjoy a little, you know, making a mess of things, so. <laughs> Did you ever regret not going to med school? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, not, not for one second. Why I, did you make that switch? I mean, because I think a lot of people. Just listen to me talk. Right? Well, it's no, this obvious, is great. Right? You're lucky. You're, I mean, you're, you're lucky and you're talented. A lot of people get stuck in jobs and careers they don't love, but they felt that that was the thing they had to do. Right. So how do they find the courage and the inspiration to walk away to really follow their heart like you did? Wow. I, I can say it wasn't easy because we do, we, do, we live in a, a an age wrought with social pressure, right? There's a lot of, you want to be the best you can be, you need to be uh, sometimes this or that, um, what your parents, you want to please your friends, you want to, and at the end of the day, when, say, you're lying on your deathbed, are you going to really hope that you pleased a lot of other people? That, of course, you want to make these people happy, but it's your life, you get one chance at it, and that was really the way I looked at my educational career. Uh, you know, I thought I was going to be a doctor because that's what successful people become. You know, that was really, it was this reverse mindset that was, it was really disturbing after I finally wrapped my head around it. <laughs> you know, when I was a young person, very impressionable, and, and I started flirting with philosophy as an undergraduate. I ended up getting a degree in philosophy in, in parallel with all the, the pre-med stuff. And I was actually in an interview at the University of Washington, and that is when I realized that this, I'm, this is the step where if I start saying yes to things like this, then I have to really commit time, energy, money, my parents' money, lo student loans, and towards a thing that is just not me, and I know it's not me. Were you a success right off the bat as a photographer? Um, you know, I think I used a 10-year overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> um, How did you get good? You get good from taking a lot of pictures, Hanson, really. You did to... you ever sort of sit there starving, eating a can of tuna, and saying, wow, I should have gone to med school? Never said I should have gone to med school. I did sit there eating a can of tuna, saying, wow. I'm eating a can of tuna. <laughs> wow, I'm eating a can of tuna. <laughs> and, uh, but I loved it more than anything because when you're on the path toward your life's passion. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. You're, you're really comfortable with, the, with, with whatever life might throw at you. So. And so once you've uh, overcome that first challenge of actually getting on your path, mm -hmm. how do you keep it all going? How do you keep the muse happy? 
That is a great question and one for me that has, um, it's loaded because if there is a passion that's driving you, the way I personally look at it as these challenges, these hurdles that come up, they're really there to keep other people out who don't want it as much as I do. Now that's something, I don't know if I'm hardwired for that, but that's something that I believe very, very, very deeply. And um, when I come up with the challenge, I'm thinking, okay, this is gonna suck because I have to go around this, over this, through this, whatever. I never look at it as a, this is a showstopper for me. And so you never I, let it get you down. You sort well, of say yeah, this is something that's going to make me better. No, I, don't, I also don't want to say that I don't always have this perfect, you know, I, I'm living in some sort of a, a, a fake world. But I do know that what, when I'm, you know, I'm on this earth, that's one of the things I was meant to do is to create stuff. And that there are other people. I also necessarily don't, don't want to think that the pie is only so big and that we're all competing. It's not a zero-sum game. So that by my achieving a goal or getting over a hurdle to a creative success doesn't necessarily mean that somebody else is not going to. But if given something that I am racing for with some, against somebody else in a, in a commercial sense for whatever reason, then I'm just driven by my passion. And I believe that maybe uh, my passion, which is ultimately one of the things that measures how hard or how far we're willing to go, is, is pretty hardcore. So I, I love your website because it's not a brochure for Chase Jarvis. It's actually a ton load of useful, relevant content if you're interested in being a creator or being a photographer. And I print out one of my favorite blog posts of yours, and I actually subtitle it Chase's Ten Commandments. <laughs> so ten, right. things every, into it. ten things every creative person, that's you, must learn. And this, is, this one that's really stood out for me is don't aim for better, aim for different. Why? Wow. I think um, well, there's, a, there's a little bit packed in there, but incrementally better which is what you know if you can shoot uh, a picture with this many lights and then I can shoot one with this many plus one um, that really doesn't define or shape the marketplace it, I mean, we're driving innovation a little bit with that idea but the idea about being a, a, a creative in, in any capacity whether a fine artist or a, or a commercial is that you have to take a picture or make something that no one else in the world can make that's the, that is really something that's going to make jaws drop and make people stop and look at your work, whatever it is, whether it's film or photography or painting, anything. If you can do stuff that no one else is doing, then you've actually done something, in my opinion, interesting. Because the first ever in the world, the first person to swim across the Atlantic Ocean, the first person to jump out of an airplane, these firsts, I think, are really interesting. And one of the ways that you can get to this first, one of the most, the, the most direct ways to get to first evers or unique perspectives is in here. I think so many people think that the art is out there, but really I'm trying to map my personal experience onto the world because there's nobody in the world that sees the world the way I do. And that's interesting. So can you verbalize your unique perspective? For example, if you were a... Uh, a musician, sure. and you were being categorized, and I hate to do this to you, no, no, in, in a music store. Sure. And if you look at your pictures, what, how would somebody cat cat generally characterize your view of the world through your lens? Um, I think there is, there's a certain grit to it, a certain sort of fundamental reality. It's sort of like a, a little bit of a stylized reality, um, and that I'll put some, I'll put a little magic dust on what is ultimately fundamentally a very, very real photograph. I aim um, in, in fine, art work, fine art work and in commercial work, I aim for the unmoment rather than the moment. And those unmoments are characterized by what feels right to me. I never, I mean, the best portraits in the world are never ones where there's someone sitting there smiling at the camera with the lamp and the, you know, the little velour chair. It's like, it's never the, the most. It's when they think the camera's off, right? Yeah, and yeah. I mean, think of, you know, the most influential pictures in, our, in the world. Eddie Adams' photograph of, in Vietnam uh, of the execution. Um, you see the, like the Ali standing over um, his fallen opponent. You see um, Warhol staring directly into the camera, for example. All those, all those are not posed moments. And so even in times where I'm shooting photographs of people who know I'm shooting, I do anything I can to throw them just a little bit off balance in the best way. And that I think that's moment. what we saw was in your Seattle 100 book, which you got here. You've got these incredible personalities from a diversity of backgrounds, and there's that amazing improvisational energy there somehow. How do you capture that? That is, I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's me trying to sort of throw my, I know a lot of, a lot of artists, I'm going to qualify this, a lot of artists, they, they, they describe themselves as, as observers and they don't want to interact with the subject because they might taint them and, or whatever. 
my approach tends to be different. Like I, I want to participate in a moment with them where if, I'm aware, if they're aware I'm with the camera or not, there's, there's something where they'll catch me looking at them with a camera. And if I can capture that moment in a way that nobody else can, either through the previous 10 minutes of us spending time together or through me being in the right place at the right time and getting that great, that great moment where their eyes actually catch the glass, then that's me sort of, that's, that's me trying to ascribe my will a little bit into the moment. And, and when uh, my will matches the will of the subject, sometimes actively, sometimes pass passively, there tends to be this cool, this cool chemistry. Can you chemistry. tell when that happens? Oh yeah. Is there something like a light bulb or you sort of feel the energy flow through you? It's a little bit of both. There's a, there's a, a feeling that I have that's very, very clear. Like I, and it's usually like, I'm pretty sure I just got that. <laughs> just nailed it. And, yeah. <laughs> I, you want your hammer back? Yeah, 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 it, right? yeah. But, but there's also, um, and I usually keep shooting because, you know, sometimes we can continue to elevate through a, a portrait session. Like for an example, the Seattle 100, I shot a lot of pictures there. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a... Uh, and, and visually, you know, nowadays with digital, a lot of the work that I do is, is in the digital world. And you can go back and look and see that you've got that. Um, it doesn't make me want to stop shooting. I never say, oh, I'm spent, and throw the camera up in the air like something you see in Hollywood. And his assistant runs around and catches the camera. But like, that there's a, there is a moment of intimacy between um, photographer and photography, between subject and, and, and shooter, that I can't really explain until you, you've lived it. It's very, very hard, but it, it's, there's something intimate. Approaching, approaching like uh, just human touch, how int intimate that is when you really captured someone in a place that, that is, is beautiful. And you made a living from it, which is incredible. Yeah, I do. I pinch myself every day. I just came from a shoot, and the fact that I'm on this side of the camera with you now, all of this is, is very surreal for me. So thanks a lot. Well, thank you. And so you've heard from Molly Moon at the peak of entrepreneurship and just now Chase Jarvis at the peak of innovation. When we return, we'll bridge these peaks. Together, we'll discuss how to harness your creative values and make a living without selling out.